But what I'd like to do is just review adult immunizations with this and, and some of the things that recently have happened and remind you about uh, some of the indications for vaccination. I would start out with this quote from Tom Frieden when he was running the CDC. The vaccines and antibiotics uh, have made many infectious diseases a thing of the past. We've come to expect the public health and modern science can conquer all microbes. But as you know, these are formidable adversaries. Um, you know, if, it's, if we're talking bacterial, you know, resistance, other things are an issue. The other thing is people now have decided that they don't need vaccines and for a variety of reasons, and we're seeing a resurgence of things that uh, in the past have been a problem. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a few scenarios. We won't try and answer them now, but we will at the end. Uh, so these are the cases. Here's a 38-year-old lady. Uh, she's two months pregnant. She has, uh, or actually she's an executive secretary in a real estate office, and before becoming pregnant was diagnosed with diabetes, and she recalls having a tetanus shot about eight years ago. Um, on screening, because she's pregnant, they find out that she doesn't have any immunity to measles, mumps, rubella, uh, or varicella. And then we'll talk about what vaccines does she need. Um, the next one's a 52-year-old gentleman. He's an account executive for an advertising agency. He unfortunately uh, drinks alcohol sometimes to excess and as a result has chronic liver disease. He has no other significant medical conditions. He had a tetanus booster about three years ago. Uh, he says he never has measles, mumps, rubella, or chicken pox that he was aware of. Um, this is a 65-year-old lady who comes in for just a routine physical um, and an office visit and a pre-Medicare physical. Uh, she's 65 years old, had a documented case of chicken pox as a child, had evidence of immunity to rubella, and is in good health. So what does she need? So trying to look at a cross-section of different individuals. Um, this is the most recent iteration of the adult immunization schedule. You can download this from CDC. Uh, they revise this every year to try and um, emphasize to people, you know, what might you need. This was actually interesting because they had redone this whole table. And they had groups where that they were asking people, what do you like, what do you not like? They even redid the colors on it because this is kind of the old colors. And the overwhelming result from healthcare providers is we don't like the new ones, they stink, go back to the other ones. Uh, which they did. And I think it, what you'll see in this is nice is they, they added on here, you'll see in some of these that says in the blue button, or. So indicating that <coughs> you could do one or the other of some of these vaccines. Uh, I think that's helpful. And also to note now that we've got recombinant zoster vaccine or RZV, um, that's out on the market as well as the um, live and activated uh, or uh, ZVL, which is Zostavax. The other is Shingrix. Um, this, I think, was helpful as well because you'll see that if you've seen this before, um, they revised it a bit because they used to just have contraindicated, but now they put delay. Uh, and if you're looking, you go to the top and it's looking at what conditions. Um, just to go back to the other, that's looking at age groups. So just following down which ones could you might consider, but then you know, going to the next slide, um, what conditions does that person have and what vaccines might be appropriate with these underlying conditions? So kind of putting both of those together would suggest to you what vaccines that you probably should offer that individual. Um, if you see it says, um, just because basically there, there's not data, with recombinant zoster vaccine uh, during pregnancy, it says to delay and really it, it should be okay but it's probably not the best time. There's no good data with this done. Pregnancy was an exclusion during the clinical trials, as well as with people that were on um, higher dose immune suppressants or people that had immune suppressant diseases. Um, and we'll talk about that when we, we talk more about uh, shingles vaccine. Uh, you see it says with, with the um, uh, live attenuated, it's contraindicated. It's a live attenuated vaccine. Live attenuated vaccines probably should be uh, not considered during pregnancy, and that's why you see a lot of those contraindicated. Um, the same thing with uh, influenza, the, the live nasal one really shouldn't be used during pregnancy. Um, most of the others you see that are in yellow or the ones that are recommended, the ones that are kind of in the light purple are ones that uh, it depends on what's going on with them. And, um, and again, you can just follow down, you see with chronic liver disease, some things that 
you may not highly recommend other people or could be recommendation if they were interested, but definitely with hepatitis and somebody has chronic liver disease, you want to give them what vaccines that are uh, around or available. Same thing with a splenia, um, end-stage liver disease, all those kind of things, um, and men who have sex with men as well, some considerations with that. So I'd just like to go through some of the vaccines and, and hit the high points of some of these. Uh, pneumococcal vaccine, realistically, we're trying to prevent infection with streptococcus pneumoniae. As you know, there's close to 100 serotypes of this. The most common manifestation of, of strep pneumonia is realistically that we would get concerned about is uh, a pneumonia, a lobar pneumonia. You could argue it's with upper respiratory diseases as well, you know, and that's why you give it to kids, looking at uh, ear infection, sinusitis, uh, more bronchitis, et cetera, and also with pneumonia. But we're trying to prevent this in adults of not only getting pneumonia, but having, quote, invasive disease, so getting bacteremia associated with it, or the worst case scenario of getting meningitis. Um, this was back, uh, gosh, nine years ago now, that uh, they came out, uh, CDC and ACIP, the um, um, group that, that looks at vaccines and makes the recommendations, Advisory Committee on the Immunization Practices at CDC. Um, usually if ACIP is comfortable and gives their benediction hand to something, then insurance companies, et cetera, will pay for it. Medicare or Medicaid will pay for it. Um, so they changed it and added a couple of things back in 2010. Um, and this was the older vaccine. This is the polysaccharide vaccine, the 23-valent polysaccharide, the PPV23. They added on to this uh, with chronic lung disease, including asthma, cigarette smoking, uh, because those were potential risk factors for uh, strep pneumonia. Uh, what they actually took out of it was to say that Alaskan uh, natives and American Indians less than age 65 should get this, because it, it's not that ethnic group, it's the medical conditions that they had, which were a little bit more common in some of those groups. So took out those identifiers, because they realistically were a non sequitur, and added um, asthma and cigarette smoking to all the other things that you see listed that they had recommended before. Um, Currently, um, this is what the recommendations are, and again, you can download it from the, the whole PDF of this. Um, it's nice you can tack it up around your desk or whatever. Somebody calls and says, what do they need for pneumococcal vaccine? This is pretty reasonable. Um, if they're 19 through 64, and they have, as you see on the left-hand side, they have uh, chronic heart or lung disease, diabetes, uh, alcoholism, chronic liver disease, and includes smoking, et cetera, and asthma then that's what you're really looking at is um, giving them 23-valent vaccine, or the old um, Pneumovax, which is the only one. There used to be three of these around over the last 30-plus years. Uh, Letterly, when there was Letterly, made new immune. There was another one, and I forget. I can't remember if it was Fujisawa. But there was another pneumococcal vaccine and in Merck's product, which was Pneumovax. And the only one that's still in existence is Pneumovax. Um, then they said, wait a year and then give them uh, the um, uh, recombinant uh, vaccine the, uh, uh, 23, from 23 to 13 valent uh, conjugate vaccine, um, which has a brand name of Prevnar, and then wait another year, um, at least five years apart, and then after they're age 65, go ahead and give them another 23 valent vaccine. But just kind of standard, so before age uh, 65, if they have those risk, uh, risk behaviors to go ahead and give them uh, 23 valent, then maybe a year later do this while, before that they're um, 25 or 25, 65, and uh, then repeat the 23 valent after age 65. But to wait five years between those two 23 valents, because that was a question we get. Well, that, I just gave them their first dose, they were 64. Do I go ahead next year and give them their second dose? No, wait five years. Um, you see it gets a little bit more complicated for the more complicated diseases, CSF leaks, cochlear implants, um, any of those things, sickle cell, uh, asplenia, congenital acquired asplenia, those are a little bit more complicated and uh, if you find them and they've not been or they haven't received any pneumococcal vaccine, it's best to start out with 13 um, to go ahead and, and give that and wait at least eight weeks, go ahead and give them 23 valent um, and then wait and give them another 23 valent five years later and at the, when they're 20, 
um, another 23 when they're 65. So they're going to get a little bit more 23 because they're probably not going to make antibody as well as they could have in the past. Then it, it, it was, well, if you turn 65, then you go ahead and give them 23 or give them 13 if they've never had any pneumococcal vaccine and give them 23 until June. That's when ACIP met again and they decided that, well, you know, a lot of older people are getting protected because younger children are getting Prevnar. Adults probably don't really need it, but now the recommendation is that um, it's a shared clinical decision making between you and the patient. If you think that it would be helpful, then you should consider giving it. But, you know, if they're adamant they don't think that they need it, then just give them 23. Um, so it now falls back on us to be a proponent of, you know, if you really think they have. If they have any of those other indications, I, I personally would give it, um, you know, give them both vaccines. So that's been that recent one. Um, and just to give you an idea, here's some scenarios. There's a 24-year-old male who has asthma, uh, uses an albuterol inhaler. Um, what do you do? Well, you can offer him 23 uh, valent vaccine now and then another dose after he's 65, as we just saw. Um, it doesn't really need 13 unless he's on chronic steroids, per the past recommendations, because he's, he's a smoker, but he's not that immune compromised. 38-year-old female with HIV who's already had 23 in 2009. Um, so she probably uh, could be considered to get 13 now because it's been way over a year since they've had 23. Um, that you could give 23, you know, realistically five years after that, uh, that 2009. And um, so there's some catch up to do with that. You could argue giving uh, both 13 and 23, but it, I, I would wait probably a year in between the two. If it's a patient who's on Medicare or Medicaid, CMS will tell you to wait a year. They'll pay for it at a year, but if you try and do it earlier, you'll find that they have some issues and wanting to pay for it. Um, so that's kind of uh, where we are with, you know, with HIV. It's probably not unreasonable to go ahead and give them 13, uh, 23 valent, and then uh, again, when they're, they turn 65, to go ahead and give them their last dose of 23. Uh, the last one is a 40-year-old male with a new diagnosis of leukemia, no pneumococcal vaccines. If you can do it before they get treated, then that would be the best, but that doesn't mean that you still can't give uh, them vaccine. It's going to be less optimal if they're neutropenic, but uh, I, if that's what's gonna happen, I think I'd probably wait until after that their counts come back and then try and immunize them. But you can give them 23 uh, as well as 13. 13 initially, 23 in eight weeks. You don't wanna wait a year, so you wanna wait you know, around eight weeks and give it, and then uh, 23 again in five years and after age 65. The last one, 67 year old uh, individual with no prior pneumococcal vaccines like we talked about. Now it's your call. Since ACIP said, well, we don't think you really have to give it, you know, they're over 65. If they have any concern or if you're concerned, maybe they're pre-diabetic or something like that, you could say, well, it might be a good idea. Um, or they have anything else uh, obviously then consider giving 13 and then uh, 23 and 6 to 12 months if you gave them 13. Moving on, these things have been around for a long time. You know, the Spanish influenza, how come it got called Spanish influenza? Because they were neutral in World War I and so when we had 1918 influenza, uh, we blamed it on the Spanish even though it really didn't come from them. A lot of it started in the United States. But this has been a real problem for us um, over the decades. <clears throat> we actually, uh, this is what you heard before uh, 2009. Uh, and 2009 was unfortunately a game changer. It showed us that influenza isn't as predictable or reliable as we thought. They always said, and it was about the same numbers, about 36,000 influenza associated deaths occurred every year. People 65 and older account for 90% of the deaths, and the number of deaths in cost of society is going to increase as the population gets older. It's those old people who are fueling this. If we, you all would just go away, we wouldn't have influenza. And then 2009 happened. 
Uh, usually, what we saw was this coming out of Asia and then going around the world. Um, it would be a new strain with pretty significant mortality and the biggest risk was being older. In 2009, the source was Mexico. It happened in uh, April. It was an H1N1, so it wasn't a new strain. Mortality was not as high as it had been in the past, but the population who uh, ended up with uh, the most morbidity and some mortality were younger people, obese people, and pregnant women. Completely different than before. The old people ruled during that outbreak, um, probably because we've been exposed to that one and been vaccinated for it. So this changed things quite a bit. Um, because it happened in 2009, a lot of this was floating around on the internet. I mean, and people looking at social media had a field day because they actually could look and went through and data mined discussions where people were talking about the flu to get an idea of really what was going on with it. Uh, since it, uh, it was called a pandemic at that time, then um, it got a lot of attention uh, from CDC and from other countries. So out of this, we knew that, uh, and this is probably the best data that we've ever had, 60 million infections, 270,000 hospitalizations, and 20, uh, instead of the 39,000 deaths, uh, there were 13,000 deaths. Better, but it'd be nice if there were zero deaths. Um, from last year, this is what we saw. Um, we're really getting a little bit better. There are a lot more tools that are out there. Uh, hospitals and some clinics are using tools to actually find out if you have influenza or not, a lot of these are um, high level NAT or PCR based and um, can tell you if it's <coughs> influenza A, influenza B, and depending on the machines that people use to tell you if it's H3N2 or H1N1 or, or is it a novel strain, does it not fit any of those? Um, and so this just shows you what happens with influenza. This actually had two waves and you can see that. And this uh, epigraph, <clears throat> you're seeing with the pink, that was H3N2 that was early on. And that's why the vaccine wasn't as good because H3N2s, vaccines aren't quite as good because H3N2s tend to, to, to drift a little bit. They'll change a little bit as time goes along, as it goes through person to person or animal to person. The vaccine isn't quite as effective as it goes along. Whereas H1N1, the vaccine tends to do better uh, in preventing disease in people, and definitely in preventing deaths. Then what you see was a B. It was more in younger individuals, uh, but some older as well, and um, a lot later in the year. So we had actually a, a double uh, year of influenza that I'm sure that you heard about. So that's why that we went from trivalent to quadrivalent vaccines, trying to give us two A's and two B's. Uh, to try and cover on what looks like from epidemiologic assessment around the world in both hemispheres that uh, what we should expect. And as you see from this, when they looked at that, we had 169 influenza-associated pediatric deaths, um, which is not insignificant. So what do we have? We have live attenuated or inactivated subunit. I always like it when people say, that shot gave me the flu the second bullet, inactivated subunit. Subunit is not whole unit, it is not alive, it is dead. It is pieces of dead virus. It cannot give you influenza. When you get that and you don't feel good, you get a sore arm, why is that happening? Your immune system. It sees this, it's recognized it as being foreign and you're making really good antibody. Hopefully you've seen it before. So you're reinforcing antibody production, which should last hopefully in most people close to a year. Um, most of what we have is egg derived, although we're trying to get away from that. Um, that version is intramuscular injection. And again, a split virus or uh, pur purified uh, surface antigen. The live attenuated is a nasal spray that's kind of in and out of fashion. Efficacy is kind of varied. Um, it's back in fashion again. Uh, it is only for ages two through 49 years of age who are healthy and not pregnant uh, because it is a live attenuated uh, vaccine. And there are some contraindications. People have asthma, uh, aspirin or salicylate um, reactions, immune compromised, uh, or if they've been on any kind of antiviral. Uh, if there was a flu outbreak and people are on Tamiflu prophylactically, you can't give them this because it's not going to work. It's going to kill the virus and you're not going to get a, a, an immune response. So there are reasons to give it, there are reasons not to give it. Um, 
when they look at what's going on with influenza, it depends on the match between, as most of you know, uh, between the vaccine and community strains, and what the hosts are, the ages that we're looking at and trying to protect people, and what's the degree of immune suppression. Um, and like I said, we've seen these published rates of how good does it work. Some years it works pretty well. Usually if it's an H1N one years, and then you might see rates as good as 60 to 70 percent. I would tell you that it's, it's like some of the direct to consumer marketing where you'll see things that say, you know, the effect is up to 12 hours. What does that mean? Well, it could last 12 hours, but it probably doesn't. Um, for most people, you might get eight hours or something out of it. So you could get coverage to 60 to 70 percent, 30 to 70 percent nursing home chronic care facility. It depends on what you're measuring. If you're measuring uh, the chance of getting influenza, those rates are probably high. If you're talking about rates of not dying if you get the flu, those rates are, are probably pretty reasonable. But it, it depends on what's going on with the person. Um, so who probably gets the most benefit uh, from this? Um, they, you know, prevents complications and death. If you're giving influenza vaccine and you can prevent getting influenza, then you're not gonna have a post-influenza pneumonia due to what, most commonly? staph and, and strep pneumo. So at one of those two you can vaccinate against. So if you're giving influenza vaccine and they've received pneumococcal vaccine, you've prevented primary pneumonia, viral pneumonia, and probably the second most common or probably first most common uh, cause of post-influenza uh, pneumonia, <clears throat> bacterial pneumonia. Uh, and it also can reduce cardiovascular events and other problems that we can see from influenza. As much as nobody really talks about it, there are uh, cases, either severe uh, morbidity or some mortality, with um, post-influenza encephalitis. And um, this was a study that came out of CID, uh, I think it was about five years ago, where they were looking at neurologic complications of the flu. It was mostly H1N1 in adults and children, and this is kind of what you see on uh, MRIs. 68% um, did not do well, 16% died. Uh, this, the people who survived had uh, prolonged neurologic sequela. And none of these people have been vaccinated. So they may have not developed as severe of a manifestation uh, if they had vaccines because it's not reported in people who had a good uh, reaction to their vaccination. Um, Obviously, you know, anybody that's six months of age or older is recommended to get flu vaccine. As soon as it comes out, it's going to be delayed this year. That's what everyone's saying. I don't know when we're going to get our drop of that, but when it gets into the community, if you can, I would get vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, live attenuated is uh, recommended again by CDC, and I haven't heard what um, that the final components are going to be but um, this is what they changed from last year. There was a change in H3N2 uh, to what you see on the screen, the, uh, a different Singapore strain than what we had the year prior, and also a change of the B, uh, the B Colorado was changed to the, um, uh, or was changed from the B Victoria line. Uh, the other two, the uh, other A and other B uh, remain the same. So, you know, you can either give this as an IM injection or a mist. Uh, there are some interesting things coming I'll just mention later on, but uh, as far as giving vaccines. Um, so there's all kinds of quadrivalent vaccines that are out. There's a couple of, um, well, there is a high dose uh, uh, trivalent vaccine that's out, but I think it's quadrivalent now as well. Um, meant to be used in people over the age of 65. Uh, we have a cell culture based trivalent uh, recombinant uh, quadrivalent that uh, is supposed to have improved H3 and 2 activity. Um, there's lots of different quads that are out there. There's an inactivated adjuvant vaccine, which we used last year, that is meant to kind of be uh, the same as the high dose, but there's no head to head trials. And we've had outbreaks of people who've received high dose versus the adjuvanted. Um, they got influenza. Uh, this last one that we had just a few months ago, I don't know, I'm assuming it was an H3N2, because uh, Labnus tells you now if it's an A or a B. Um, our prior outbreak we had was an H3N2, 
and people got high dose. All of the people in CLC that got it had high dose except one guy because he was not 65 years of age. He was 64 and he got regular vaccine. So you can break through, but the good news was none of the, well, there was one that I think decompensated his underlying COPD a little bit, but that was a kind of a soft call uh, to bring him back over to the hospital. Everybody else did fine. Um, and um, there's a quadrivalent live attenuated as well, as we kind of mentioned. Uh, I just put this in here because it, the efficacy of the vaccine does seem to depend on host responses. This was an interesting paper that was in Journal of Infectious Diseases in 2017 and looking at assessing people for frailty. And the bottom line was people that are more frail tend to not do well with influenza vaccine. They, they don't mount a good of a response as people who are more active and everything. So if you're more of a healthy, active elderly individual, then you should do better with influenza vaccine. Um, the uh, editorial was from Kathy Newsel, who does a lot of influenza vaccines and other vaccines. Um, and um, that was kind of their thought uh, with this as well. The other thing that's interesting is uh, some of the newer investigative vaccines are going into phase threes. Uh, what we normally do is, if you remember the, the neurometadases, you know, everything that changes is on the top part, right? So that's where that you're seeing all the different varieties of influenza. But this, the stem or what some people call stock portion that you see um, doesn't significantly change as much. And if you're looking at 1918 influenza and the changes over time, um, a lot more changes up in the head area uh, than what you see in the stem. So some of the newer vaccines are targeting not only the, the top portion of neuromenidase, but the stalk area, which doesn't change. The idea is if you get good antibody to that, it should be longer acting. You shouldn't need vaccinations annually. You might be able to get by with it five years, 10 years, who knows, 20 years. Since it's not out there yet, we can't look at durability of the vaccine. But that's what's anticipated because that just doesn't seem to change so much. So that would be great news if you have it, probably give a better immune response, uh, hopefully protect people um, a little bit better and for longer duration. Whooping cough. Now I'm just going to ask a question and probably I'll be really interested if anybody knows who these gentlemen are who celebrated a um, 100 years of Bourdais Jean Jou. What did they do with pertussis? Auger, right? Absolutely, it was the auger. They were the one that came up with media to grow yeah. or to tell a pertussis on. Does the auger have their pictures in it? Like the, the auger actually looks just like that button. Uh, no, it, it actually doesn't. I asked that question, I can't remember, several years ago, and they said, well, the Bordeaux, uh, the Bordeaux guy came up with wine. I said, it's not Bordeaux. <laughs> That's spelled differently. So no, they didn't come up with a wine, but they came up with culture media uh, so that we could actually grow Bordeaux telepertosis. Um, and this is one of those, you know, when they talk about emerging or re-emerging diseases, this is kind of a re-emerging disease, but probably uh, it seems as though it, it has come back on us because we've changed the vaccine. Uh, if you look at old data and looking back through the 50s and the, the first uh, vaccines that came out, the, as in, in the cap letters, uh, DTP, well, that was using uh, whole cell pertussis. It was really immunogenic. It was so immunogenic that people wished their arm would fall off because it hurt so much when they got vaccinations. Um, they just didn't do well with that. People didn't like it, but it gave them long-term protection. Um, and so then we changed it to acellular. That was a lot better tolerated. People, yeah, I might get a sore arm, but it wasn't as bad as the other. So a lot more people were willing to take the vaccine. And then we got into, with the initial one, that was DTAP, and then the uh, one that we gave people who'd never had or had, had uh, vaccination a long time ago to give them Tdap. And again, that's the acellular pertussis vaccination. Um, and that's when we started seeing issues and people started wondering, well, what's going on with that? Um, these are the current recommendations that came out in 2017 to, between these three different vaccinations. So if you look at Tdap, um, you know, between ages of seven to 10, usually you don't give it, uh, 11 to 18, usually they're getting a, another dose because they got uh, Dtap earlier. 
Um, and then you see the other recommendation was in pregnant women. Why give this to pregnant women? Because you can't vaccinate the child. Look at, I mean, two months. Okay, so that period of time right after, pregnant, right after delivery is a really significant time where they could get exposed to this, and that's happened. So if you're giving women when they're pregnant vaccinations, even though they've had it before, you're going to boost their immunity, you get transplacental transfer of passive immunity. And so after that child's going to have that for a few months until hopefully that they can get vaccinated. So you're bridging during that. Uh, and if there was an outbreak, then you try and vaccinate people who are going to come in contact with, you know, that child trying to do, quote, cocooning. Um, so that's, that was the recommendation. Uh, and it was between 27 and 36 weeks. Uh, I put this around there because this is what's in uh, the vaccines. And you see with both the vaccines, there's only two that are out there, um, Adacel and Boostrix, from two different manufacturers. Uh, both of them have almost the same about of this pertussis antigen, it says PRN, but that is abbreviation for protactin. It's a surface protein uh, from Bordetella pertussis. Uh, we already kind of went through these recommendations, you know, that uh, everybody should get at least one dose of Tdap in replacement for their standard tetanus diphtheria um, that people would get every 10 years. Um, and it doesn't matter when you, you could have got your TD last week and you could still get Tdap, especially if there was something going on in the community. Um, those were the recommendations, you know, healthcare workers, especially if they're going to come in contact with infants to make sure that you get, ex uh, get your vaccine so you don't unwillingly get uh, pertussis and give it to the child if you're a healthcare worker. And we mentioned uh, pregnant women, those age groups, but it's with each and every pregnancy. Um, if you missed it during pregnancy for whatever the reason, it wasn't offered or nobody, somebody didn't show up, um, you give it as soon as you can after delivery uh, to mom. Um, this was an interesting article because it said, uh, and this was 2016 data out of Canada, um, that the vaccination doesn't seem to last that long. We thought it would last at least 10 years. Then we started seeing these outbreaks and they thought, well, maybe, well, first we thought it was lifelong. Then it was like maybe 10 years. Now the data suggests maybe four to five years at best. So this is something that may or may not be long term. And it's probably because, again, it's an acellular pertussis. Uh, the other thing was this outbreak that they had in Australia uh, several years ago. Now this was reported back in 2014. But what they saw was a little bit, you can see the blips and, you know, when they were vaccinating and then kaboom, they had an, out, uh, an outbreak and they were vaccinating people with Tdap, didn't seem to work as well. And what they found out was that 30% of their uh, Bordetella pertussis isolates didn't have uh, protactin on the surface. So if there's no target and you have immunity based on that target, doesn't see the target the vaccine doesn't work as well. So it's one of the surface proteins. It's not the only one, but you're losing efficacy of the vaccine when that, uh, the bacteria is actually trying to camouflage itself, if you will. Uh, herpes zoster, shingles. I'm sure no one has seen anybody with this disease. It's so uncommon. It's not uncommon, it's pretty common. Um, although occasionally gets misdiagnosed as other things, but this is the most typical uh, shingles rash that I'd seen in a long time. We are actually down in clinic and uh, we were doing the initial um, attenuated uh, virus vaccine trial for shingles and a lady grabbed me and said, oh, I, I need you to come over and see this guy with shingles. And I said, sure, what can I do? He said, well, I know you're doing a study. I just thought you'd like to see it. We've seen a lot as that trial went on. It's a five-year trial and then we did five years looking at durability of the vaccine. But this one's very classic, that one-sided, you know, this kind of confluent erythema with vesicles. The vesicles start out as clear. Then they're going to start changing. A lot of times you'll see them getting whitish. That doesn't necessarily mean they're infected. That's just the immune response. Then they, uh, they may break open, crust over, and heal. It usually takes about two weeks or so. If that was it, would we come up with a vaccine? Probably not. I mean, it'd be like any other thing that blisters and comes up and, and you know. But it's the post herpetic neuralgia. And it's a recognition to treat early, within 72 hours if possible, because that decreases the chance of PHN. 
um, the vaccine also decreases the chance of having this in the first place or making it attenuated. So that's the reason realistically for giving vaccine. Um, the study chair for our, uh, the shingles prevention study, the VA trial where we looked at giving the live attenuated, that was one of his patients from years ago who had V1, nasty V1 zoster as you can see. Um, this is a patient I took care of a long time ago actually in this facility um, who had small cell cancer of the lung and um, it was interesting because when he showed up, that's what he had, and he had some ulceration on his palate. Um, and actually, they asked ENT to come and see him. ENT thought that he had mucor left and never came back. Well, he survived this, so it tells you he didn't have mucor. Um, he's got the second branch of the facial nerve. He's got V2 zoster. Um, he survived that. He actually got super infected with staph. Uh, survived all that, but didn't beat his lung cancer, unfortunately. Um, so this is what we look at is the, uh, the occurrence of zoster. Uh, it tends to increase as we get older. It's not impossible to have it even at a younger age. Um, it, the thought was if you got shingles when you were young, that might be a sign that you're immune compromised or you could have an undiagnosed malignancy and we recommend all these huge workups for kids who ended up with shingles and then found out they didn't have any of that. So you don't see any of that literature recently, but it's still out there, and people will still ask you about, oh my God, do I need to work them up for a cancer or something? The answer is usually no. Uh, and most often, it, they, they ended up getting exposed to chicken pox, which is this just reactivated chicken pox, really early in their life. They may not have been vaccinated. Um, we know that uh, sometimes mom has an outbreak, maybe, you know, as they're breastfeeding or whatever, the child comes in contact with mom, child later gets shingles, and if they get it really early in life, they may reactivate that uh, earlier in life. Uh, where we get interested is uh, from that area, the posterpedic neuralgia, which starts becoming more of an issue around age 50, but uh, as time goes along, then it becomes more and more of an issue. Um, a lot of that is due to, you know, as you get older, getting a good immune response to this because you've seen it for a long time. It's lying dormant in your dorsal root ganglia. And unless it's, it's popping out every so often, you're probably not going to make good antibody, you know, B cell or T cell activation for this. Um, and you'll have a flare, and that's why you get this locally, uh, usually in one dermatome. Um, the other issue is it is associated with an increase in strokes or CVAs for the first three to six months after having shingles. So if you could prevent that, you might prevent uh, some individuals having a CVA or an MI. Um, the highest risk is with uh, it on the face and that if you recognize this early and you can turn off the inflammation from this by starting them on antivirals, Generally, you're going to shut down viral replication in around 24 hours or so um, using a prodrug. I, I would highly recommend using a prodrug for this because you're going to get bioavailability. Uh, of giving 800 milligrams of acyclovir five times a day, I would personally call punitive dosing because people don't take pills five times a day very well. Although if they're having pain or anything, they, it's usually an incentive. But um, giving, you know, famcyclovir, uh, three times a day, or valgan or valacyclovir, um, you get better absorption. You can get kind of close to almost what you would get IV. So remember that you need higher doses of acyclovir to treat VZV than you do for herpes simplex. Uh, we've seen people correct dosing, but I mean a correct interval, but not not a high dose. They're dosing it uh, using the the doses that you would for herpes simplex and BZV is going to laugh at that and keep going. So uh, those are the things that, you know, we should be concerned about. And that, but that is a good reason for vaccination is trying to prevent those complications. Uh, the one that we looked at here was uh, the same thing that they gave for chickenpox. It was the OCA strain of live attenuated uh, varicella vaccine. What were the downsides? You have to keep it frozen and you have to really monitor that to make sure that most places that store it are going to put it into a self-defrosting freezer. So you can't put it up next to the wall. Other thing, you have to keep it away from the walls and you really need to make sure that the temperature of the vaccine stays within uh, the manufacturer's limits, which is around, you know, uh, minus, God, now I forget. 
Um, ours is a minus 20 freezer that we still use for other things. And I think we are uh, keeping it at around, well, it usually stayed around minus 18 to minus 20. A little variations when people open a door. Um, it's a much higher dose, if you will. It's 14 times uh, or slightly more of the dose you would give for chickenpox prevention. It has approximately um, 19,600 plaque forming units. Uh, some of it is a little higher. The other thing is that um, ACIP said it's only for 16 and over. Merck has a study that the FDA approved. It was 50 through 59. But there can be an issue with that. FD, uh, the ACIP did not recognize that, and I'll mention that in just a second. It was a one-time vaccine and still remains a one-time vaccination. Um, it's not an IM. It's a sub-Q. So that's a little different than the other vaccine that we have now. Uh, that was our data that we came out with. Overall, 51% uh, reduction in shingles. There were three different age strata, and you see it a little bit better in the younger strata, 60 through 69 versus 70 through 79 and greater than 80. Uh, vaccine efficacy in the 80-year-old group was not robust, almost 20%. And people said, well, then why even give it? 20% is better than 0%. So it's not as robust as other populations. Um, the other thing that was looked at was, what's the efficacy in preventing post neuralgia? Overall, it was almost 40%. Not as much in the younger strata, because they weren't getting it anyway, so you would expect to have less um, post-herpetic neuralgia. Uh, you did see a significant reduction uh, between the other two strata, uh, but it wasn't zero, obviously. Um, how often could you give this after shingles? That was my biggest concern when it went for approval. Um, they said, oh, well, you could, you should give it after somebody had shingles. We excluded shingles in the shingles prevention trial. So where's that data coming from? Somebody might have got misdiagnosed. You don't want to not give them the chance of having shingles vaccination. But I knew what was going to happen is somebody's going to have shingles, and next week they're going to say, I want the vaccine. Remember, when you get real shingles, you're not seeing, your body's not experiencing 19,600 plaque-forming units. It's experiencing millions of plaque-forming units. you got real disease. You're stimulating your immune system significantly, and that's what this vaccine was trying to do, is to rev up your immune system so that you don't reactivate VZV. So giving it right after somebody has shingles doesn't really make much sense. Um, as one of the PIs in one of our meetings said, yeah, it's like trying to change the salinity of the ocean by peeing in it. Um, doesn't really make that much of an effect. So realistically, you should wait a period of time. Um, my thought was, with not really good data, we had some data from the study, but you could wait definitely six months. Even for people that have mild disease, you could probably still wait six months because they just juice their immune system. Um, for other people, the data, our data suggested you could go even out to three years. That was never a recommendation because nobody had firm data. So it was, well, you know, you, you can wait a period of time, uh, and some people just gave it. Um, the other question was how durable is it? This, this study was never designed to look at durability. There were a little more than half of us that stayed on to do the durability. Um, and what we found out by looking at this durability uh, after vaccination started to fall off at five years, and most people was pretty much gone at eight years. The next question is what do we do? Do we give them this vaccine again, or what do we do? Nobody knew. Who's going to pay for it? It was not an inexpensive vaccination, so there was a lot of confusion as to what to do with this. Um, then we had the recombinant zoster vaccine. It is not live. It is a glycoprotein E. It's a piece of the cell wall, or I'm sorry, of the capsid. Um, so it is not a live attenuated. It is a piece, and it's got a new adjuvant that was in there. So it is an adjuvanted vaccine, same as what we have somewhat with influenza. Um, this does require an IM injection. As a matter of fact, this is a two-dose vaccine. At uh, time zero, the initial injection, then two to six months later. Um, you don't have to freeze this. With uh, live attenuated, you had up to 30 minutes to give it. The, the quicker you gave it, the better, the, the more amount of live virus is still gonna be alive. 
If you wait 30 minutes, you might as well just not even give it. Um, some people would say, well, I don't stock it, but you can go down to the pharmacy and get it, bring it here, we'll give it to you to get that nominal amount of money. Um, and people would say, okay, they go to the pharmacy, they put it in a bag, um, then they say, oh, I'm hungry, I'm going to go someplace and get something to eat, and they show up at the doctor's office an hour later. It was thawed out, you might as well just toss it. Um, that was the issue with live attenuated. With this, you really don't have that. After you admix it, it is lyophilized, uh, it's stable for up to six hours, and you can keep it in the refrigerator. So you don't have to freeze it. Uh, it's stable for a much longer period of time. Um, it has been recommended for immune competent individuals age 50 and over. Uh, it is recommended that you can give this to people who got uh, uh, live attenuated. Uh, by very narrow margin, the ACIP recommended it over recombinant uh, as the initial vaccination, uh, and again for 50 years and older. Uh, this was part of the data that was presented at that meeting by Kathleen Dooling, and the yellow bars there are looking at uh, the different age strata, uh, 50 through 59, 60 through 69, and over 70, and you see, I mean, even in people who are older, 91% efficacy were the best that our vaccine got was around 30 some percent. So it is uh, a significant vaccine. Uh, I will tell you that, um, you know, when can you give it after uh, Zoster? Nobody really knows. And they were trying to ferret this out and they ended up saying, well, if you look at all this, uh, nobody really knows. Uh, you shouldn't give it more than two months after you gave live attenuated Zoster vaccine. I would tell people, you know, you just gave the other, there's not a rush to have to give a uh, recombinant vaccine. You wanna wait six months, you could argue, I mean, depending on how old they are, um, you could probably even wait a year, but patients don't wanna hear that, especially if they've had Zoster before. I had it before, I don't want it again, I want it today. Your rash just went away yesterday, I don't care, I want it today. That's what you'll have to deal with. Um, is it gonna to hurt to give it to them sooner? No, um, but with this, remember it's two dose, and there's significantly more local site reactions. People not uncommonly don't feel so hot and will get a sore arm out of this for a day or two. Um, can you give it to immune suppressed people if they're on low dose, uh, less than 20 milligrams a day of prednisone or equivalent using inhaled or topical, um, not so much PO, um, and they, they say that, oh, soon we'll have data on other immune compromising diseases of people on dialysis or HIV that data still hasn't been presented to ACIP. Uh, they, uh, uh, Glaxo has data, I've seen that data, but it's not what anybody's recommending at this point. Some of it's actually looking at three dose. So that's still forthcoming. Um, so what else is making the news? Mumps, still making, you know, having outbreaks. Um, that got attention when parts of the National Hockey League players started getting it and um, so we've seen mumps coming back, um, and that the, the biggest thing with this is that of uh, the three vaccinations and MMR, this is probably the least effective uh, in preventing the, with two doses of this, you get about 88% coverage. So it means that realistically, uh, even vaccinated people could still get mumps. Um, if there are outbreaks going, this was the most recent recommendation was if you're in an area where that there's a mumps outbreak, you go ahead and give a third dose of MMR. Um, that's probably gonna rev up immunity that should last for about a year. Uh, it's unclear if it lasts any longer than that. So if we were to have an increased amount of mumps in the area, then um, for younger individuals, they probably should get this. I had the real thing. You don't want the real thing. Measles, you know, that's uh, happening unfortunately. This is the most recent data. They've had over uh, almost 1,200 cases of measles now uh, that's been noted more in those states um, and most of this is from people who were not vaccinated so again it's important for healthcare workers to know what their status is if you don't know what your measles status is you should get it checked I mean they're saying for people born after 1957 I was born prior to that I still got my title check because I couldn't remember if I had measles or not I know I had mumps and I had chicken pox um, but I, I had been exposed and I still had uh, significant measles titer. Um, you really want to know that as an ID person because if you're going to walk into a room, you don't want to get yourself exposed. Um, so uh, meningococcal vaccine um, basically is for congregate living facilities. 
people going to college or military. Military takes care of their own. Uh, the other one that we, we do offer to is microbiologists who uh, can certainly see this. Uh, we don't want them getting this, or HIV patients. Um, for HIV patients, we also talk about giving meningococcal B. There is a difference between the two that are there. You can't interchange them because one's two dose, the other's three dose. So you can't give one of one and one of the other and think you're done. You have to pick one and stick with it. Um, the other one I'll mention to you, I don't know that we see that many, is for people that have um, paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, uh, eclusimab, because what does it do? It's active against uh, B cells, so you're going to lose the ability to make antibody to meningococci. And they've had people who, they got vaccinated, but they even broke through. So you might have to put them on penicillin prophylaxis while they're on uh, Solaris. Uh, the new HPV vaccine, I don't have any experience with. It's two dose, uh, supposedly better um, reactions with that, uh, better immunity. Uh, the only downside is recommendation not to give it to people uh, who have had uh, heart uh, any kind of cardiovascular events because they've had higher rates of that. So you, it's not that you can't give it to people, but really uh, during the trials, their cardiovascular rates were higher than with other hepatitis B vaccines. And again, you can't go back and forth between hepatitis B vaccines if you're trying to prophylax people. Um, it, it's recommended you stay with the same one all the time. Uh, hep A, I don't have to tell you, there's now this emerging outbreak of Hep A. Um, I'd never been vaccinated against Hep A. I'm getting concerned at this point because, I mean, you're getting it through food. Uh, there have been foodborne outbreaks in places that you wouldn't imagine. So it, it's probably something that we should all reconsider. Um, and those are the ones that are out there. They're, remember, you can give A and B together, um, but giving Twinrix is not approved for post-exposure prophylaxis. So if somebody said, oh, so-and-so establishment has an outbreak of uh, Hep A, uh, you should probably get prophylaxed with this, you know, within the first week or so. You can't get that one if you've, you know, if you've never had Hep B, that one's not recommended for that. So you can get either of the other two top ones, the GSK or the Merck products. Uh, and HPV, all I'm going to mention is they raise the, the age rates. Uh, it, but it's not a firm recommendation. It's that same like they did with, uh, with Prevnar. Uh, it's shared clinical decision making of people the ages through 27 through 45. But we've encountered this. We've had individuals um, who have not really been sexually active. If they have, they've only been with one partner who uh, really doesn't seem to have had HPV, but now they're in a different relationship and they want to get this, but they were above the age of 26. You could give it off label, but they're going to have to pay for it and it's not inexpensive. So now, since this recommendation, the chances are that they, they may very well be able to get you know part of this at least paid for by insurance if they have insurance. Uh, but again, that was uh, in June as well. Uh, so these, these three cases, uh, to finish up quickly, uh, the 38-year-old lady who's two months pregnant uh, who was diabetic, she had a tetanus shot eight years ago, she doesn't have any immunity to mumps, measles, rubella, and varicella, so what vaccine should we give? She need Tdap? Yep, at that time. Very good. Third trimester. I always like those trimesters. It's like quotidian fevers. <laughs> it's always an interesting term. What about MMR? A bad idea. No, she's pregnant. Let's not do that. Let's wait till after she's <laughs> not pregnant. Uh, varicella? Nope, same thing. Uh, it's a live virus vaccine, so can't do that. Influenza? Yes, please. Uh, pneumococcal, she has diabetes, so you could consider it in her. Uh, hep A, mm, well, the answer is no, uh, but it, now it depends on where you are and what's going on in your area. Um, it could be yes, I probably should change this. Uh, hep B, uh, not really, because she's not doing anything that should get her uh, exposed to that. Meningococcal, no, nah, no real thing going on with that. HPV? No, not really, but it, she could get it, you know, uh, if she asked later on, if they're, you know, you're talking to each other and suggest it. We're almost done. Yeah. Sorry. Six minutes over. Um, so this, this gentleman who has underlying liver disease, uh, yeah, he should get Tdap and a booster. MMR, no. Um, varicella? 
No. Influenza, yes. Pneumococcal, yeah, because he's got liver disease. Hep A, yeah, if he's, he's not had it, yes, two dose series. Hep B, three, or maybe hep, uh, hep will save if he doesn't have anything else going on. Meningococcal, no. HPV, no, not really. And the last lady, uh, she's 65, been in good health. Um, she need that, yes. MMR, no. She was born before 57. Varicella, no. Influenza, yes. Pneumococcal, yes. Um, a single dose, and you could argue that you could talk to her about um, Prevnar as well, but she really didn't have anything that would want you to really probably give it with, with her. She doesn't have any other underlying diseases. Hep A, unless she requests. Hep B, Menage, no. HPV, probably not. Shingles, yeah. Um, and probably give her recombinant um, uh, zoster vaccine. Uh, so for that, thanks. Sorry, I ran.